It's been a long day, but a fascinating day, and I guarantee you it's going to get even better now, which is a big high bar because it's been an excellent set of discussions. You know these two folks, I know you do. Uh, on my right, uh, the Honorable Patrick Kennedy, of course, former member of Congress, a national advocate for mental health care, uh, born of his own experience, which he's quite candid in talking about, and uh, here to give us uh, the perspective, obviously, from the D side of the House. Uh, so Patrick, thanks so much for being with us. I should mention briefly, you have more detailed bios on, your, on the app, so please consult them. These two folks have uh, very distinguished backgrounds, as you know. And then over here on my left, uh, Dr. Tom Price, of course, uh, se former Secretary of Health and Human Services, also former member of Congress as well, an orthopedic surgeon mm -hmm. by training. Uh, and I guess, just to make the obvious points, these two clearly are battling with a very important uh, struggle, really, with an important pre-existing condition, having been members of Congress, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, and it's I know untreatable. <laughs> and I know they are uh, still, in still, still in recovery <laughs> mode uh, from that experience now. Well, this conference theme obviously has been about disruption, uh, innovation, and transformation. So speaking of disruption, innovation, and transformation, we just had an election last week. Uh, and as we know, we're still counting the votes in some places. This is a, a novel concept, unlike the Electoral College. Uh, it, in most of the rest of elections, you actually have to find out who got the most votes, and that person <laughs> wins. Uh, so obviously, we're still struggling with a couple of uh, states on that score, and as we know, there was just an announcement today of a House vote in Maine, uh, finally, so we'll, we'll know more. Obviously, the Florida recount is underway, but what we do know now is that the House of Representatives is now in Democratic hands, Democrats having picked up, by the latest projections, probably 39 votes in total. Uh, the Senate, of course, remains in Republican hands, Republicans having picked up two, possibly three seats there. Uh, so a different set of dynamics, obviously, that w than we have had in the last couple of years. The White House, of course, remaining uh, in Republican hands. We also know uh, lots of shifts among the governors, uh, with uh, at least uh, seven pickups on the Democratic side in the governor's races. And we also know lots of new faces coming into the House of Representatives. More women than ever will be serving now in the U.S. Congress. Uh, lots of more diversity, uh, particularly, than has been the case. So a very, very different ballgame. So I want to ask you both briefly, just as we get started here, let's take the long view of what all of this disruption, transformation, and innovation now is going to mean for the health policy outlook at the federal level over the next couple of years, as best as you can see today. And I know you all have extremely fine-tuned uh, periscopes and crystal balls that you, allow you to see perfectly into the future. Given what you know today about how things seem to be shaping up, what do you think the future looks like? Tom, let's start with you on that. Well, thanks, Susan, and thanks to Moss Adams for the invitation and for uh, allowing me to participate. I am excited about being here with Patrick and excited about being here with all of you. Um, anybody that works in the field of health care, uh, I, I take my hat off to them because uh, taking care of patients, uh, regardless of your role in all of that, sometimes is difficult, and oftentimes it's made more difficult because of what happens in, in Washington. So uh, uh, thank you for the work that you do day in and day out. Um, historic election. Uh, we, as you mentioned, there are over 100, I think you mentioned over 100 women in the House of Representatives, first time ever, which is, uh, which is exciting. Um, it was also, his, yeah, that's right. But also, maybe now we'll get some, something really done, right? So uh, um, it's also uh, historic because it's only the fourth time since the uh, Civil War where um, a party lost seats in the House but gained them in the Senate. So there's a dynamic that's going on out there that is, that is fascinating. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that we have an absolute crystal ball on it, either Patrick or myself, uh, but, I, but, but there's a dynamic that's going on and it, and it feels like a, a, a reorganization of the parties. Um, and or a realignment, and we're in the middle of that, I think, and so we'll see uh, how that all how that all comes out. And when you're in the middle of a storm, um, it, it it sometimes isn't 
isn't very comfortable or, or uh, uh, pleasant. And so, uh, uh, and I think that's kind of where we are right now. Um, uh, from a healthcare standpoint, obviously things need to get done. Healthcare, uh, the challenges in healthcare uh, continue uh, apace uh, over and over and over. Um, the ability for those providing care uh, to take care of those patients uh, needs obviously addressing from a public policy standpoint for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which is we still continue to have 28 million folks out there without uh, health coverage. Uh, we've got 11 million folks in the exchange market who uh, uh, one might suggest are having some challenges because of deductibles and things like that. Um, and then you've got a si we've got a siloed system where things do folks don't necessarily play well with each other. And so there are a lot, of, a lot of challenges that exist out there. I think the concern that people in the audience would have as, as those across the nation is, are, are these folks going to be able to play well together and, and, and get something done? Or is it just going to be two years of, of tit for tat? Um, I think they can get something done. I'm hopeful that they do. I, was, uh, I always tried to promote positive solutions when I was in my public, uh, public offices. Um, and, and the areas where I think there, there, uh, it might be some commonality are drug prices. Uh, the administration is clear about their concern about drug prices, uh, um, and we may talk a little bit more about that. I think um, uh, the 42 CFR Part 2, which is near and dear to some of the folks in, in this audience, is uh, heart, the, the privacy issues as it relates well, and, to... Well, and let's just explain that for those who don't, aren't down in the weeds of this. this. This relates very much to the opioid situation, but go ahead. And yeah, say the more. inability for, for caregivers or for providers to share certain information with adult patients, uh, either in the mental uh, behavioral health uh, area or in, in the opioid uh, area. And oftentimes those are the individuals, those, those family members and the like who are the, the, the loving members of that of that, uh, uh, that group, that family, they aren't able to know necessarily because of the rules and because of the law um, uh, about what's happening to one of their family members. And that many folks believe, I'm one of them, believe that that ought to be, uh, that ought to be modified and, and, and changed. I think there are some tax issues that could be addressed together, um, delaying medical device tax again, the, the, uh, um, uh, and some other taxes that I think could see some commonality of, uh, of themes. And then the technical aspects of meaningful use and, and electronic medical records and, and um, interoperability and those things, I think there's some commonality of, 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 uh, of concern and, and uh, desire and goals. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to move forward in some positive ways on things, understanding that there are still big issues out there about which there's not a whole lot of common agreement. Great. Patrick, how do you see it in the wake of this historic election, as Tom said? To my friend Brandon Staglin, who has uh, done such a great job at One Mind, who I'm honored to work with, uh, you know, for years now um, at One Mind. I also just want to say, you know, in the Congress, uh, Tom and I, whenever we'd come to the floor of the House and someone was saying exactly what we wanted to say, uh, we'd have one of two solutions. We could read our own speech which was basically exactly what they had already said, or we could say, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks of the gentleman of Georgia in this instance, because I think Tom did a terrific job kind of encapsulating both the political environment in the wake of the election, as well as the issues that the Congress and the President are going to be facing where there might be some commonality. I really couldn't have uh, said it any best, so I, I won't bear uh, repeating it uh, just for the sake of repeating it, but uh, we can go on to other questions. Okay, stipulated uh, there too. You yield back the balance I of your time. I yield back the balance say. of my okay. time, right. Great. All right, well, let's pick up on the point, Tom, that you made, and I, and I know, Patrick, you agree with this. There are the high-level issues that cause a lot of friction between the parties, but then there are lots of issues where there is a lot of agreement, and that doesn't tend to get the headlines, but it's real. You mentioned a few, obviously, opioids, mm -hmm. drug prices, et cetera. Earlier today, uh, a spokesperson from the advisory board, uh, Leonard uh, uh, Len Wichek, I think uh, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, did mention a couple of others as well. He said industry consolidation mm -hmm. was something that both sides could look at together. And that, of course, 
particularly with respect to hospital consolidation. Uh, price transparency, he thought there was also a lot of bipartisan agreement that, that would be important to move in that direction. And the other one he mentioned was bolstering uh, rural health facilities. And we know there have been an enormous number of closures of uh, rural hospitals in particular on top of an ex pre-existing access uh, problem in those rural areas. So as we think about those, and opioids, of course, being at the top of the list, we do know major package of bills was signed into law uh, under the umbrella of the Support Act uh, just uh, last month. Patrick, you served on the Opioids Commission that the president appointed. And I, if I recall correctly, there were about 100 plus recommendations coming out of that commission report. Not many of them got incorporated. Some of them obviously got incorporated in this legislation, but there's more to go. So. Is that going to be an area of additional cooperation among the parties? And that, if so, what happens? Um, well, obviously, I think there will have to be um, some cooperation. The, the rural health issue is really an issue of access. And that's an issue that transcends geography, because there can be a, an access problem for people even, even living in a major urban area when it comes to, for example, accessing mental health services. Um, telemedicine, I think, is going to be a real game changer in the delivery of overall medicine, but especially mental health and addiction medicine. And it was really shocking <clears throat> that the Congress and the administration wasn't able to move further, faster on, you know, really putting out not only a regulatory framework, um, but also financial reimbursement for telemedicine. Um, I, I would think that we could have moved a lot faster. Some of the recommendations of the bill the president signed were uh, to come up with greater guidance between the Secretary of HHS and Attorney General and other agencies. But to me, that that's just uh, a too slow approach when and, you've and got this an epidemic. particularly with respect to uh, medication assisted treatment in the context of the opioid crisis you're particularly about, yeah. around uh, MAT um, but just in general I think we understand that telemedicine can be a, a real game changer and um, and we do know just in the past year we had a uh, passage of the Chronic Care Act, which was incorporated into the budget uh, law passed in February, which expanded some capabilities in telemedicine. Uh, we now have CMS, uh, as we heard earlier today, so we have some new codes, which of course is the prerequisite to having anything happen in payment and uh, uh, applying to other aspects of virtual care. Do you see this as another area where the parties could agree to move further faster, as Patrick said? not just necessarily with respect to addiction treatment uh, and MAT, but more broadly, Tom. Yeah, I, I, I think so, but there's a challenge with the amount of money. Um, uh, the opioid uh, crisis has generated one of the, uh, a unique situation in Washington from a, from a uh, unanimity standpoint. The bill that passed uh, uh, and that the President signed into law in October, I think the vote in the Senate was 98 to 1. And in the House, it was 393 to 8, as I recall. So um, th this is, uh, and, and there are bills that, that get that kind of, uh, of support, but this is, uh, th this is fairly unique for um, uh, an issue of such significant import for, for the country. Um, when I was in my brief tenure at HHS, the, the, um, and that process that we went through um, on the repeal and replace bill, there was some uh, conversation at that time about the opioid crisis. And there was discussion about how much money ought to be included in the legislation to address the opioid crisis. And there was essentially agreement, this is in the summer of 17 now, that at that time, um, both sides, Republicans and Democrats, agreed that there ought to be at least $4 billion a year for 10 years, so $40 billion over 10. Um, by the end of last year, that didn't pass, obviously, but by the end of last year, um, that number had grown to $10 billion over 10, or $100 billion uh, over 10 years. Um, that didn't pass either, but what did pass at the end of this past fiscal year was $8.5 billion increase for fiscal year 19, where we currently find ourselves. So there's, there is a, a strong support for significant resources for what I, what I believe is, is one of the, uh, uh, the absolute uh, paramount crises of our society that need to be addressed. Um, 
My concern is that Washington oftentimes appropriates money and then says, okay, you figure it out. And, and sometimes uh, the agencies and the departments figure it out. And sometimes they don't. And, and, and oftentimes that money can be wasted. Um, and that's the concern that I, that I think uh, uh, members of Congress in the United States Senate uh, uh, share right now uh, about how to make certain that evidence-based uh, treatment is, is utilized um, to make certain that that money is going for something that's actually going to diminish uh, the, um, just the, the tragedy of the numbers that, that we see. Uh, I, I know that Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Bell and, and, and Dr. Devine earlier presented on the opioid uh, treatment that they've been undertaking in, in Minnesota, which have been very exciting, by the way. I was really intrigued by their, by their presentation. Um, but, but I think what they demonstrated clearly is that it takes community involvement, local involvement, in order to address this issue. And Washington does local involvement poorly. Um, and so one of the concerns that I know is, uh, exists on, on uh, my side of the aisle, the Republican side of the aisle, is that that $8.5 billion or $10 billion or whatever it's going to be uh, isn't, isn't uh, just poured into a hole that doesn't actually result in that local engagement and involvement and success stories that uh, can exist out there. I think it's fair to say that people very close to this crisis think that the federal response up to this point has been pathetic mm -hmm. uh, and maybe is just slightly less pathetic, going to be slightly less pathetic now with the passage of this, of this law. But still uh, very pathetic. But still pathetic. <laughs> I mean, uh, HIV AIDS was getting $24 billion a year, and we're all doing jumping jacks thinking that we've done something great by appropriating five to six billion. One fifth of what HIV AIDS, and they were, we were losing 53,000 lives a year during the height of the HIV AIDS crisis. We're losing 72,000 a year, uh, 20,000 more, and yet we're spending one-fifth the amount we're spending on AIDS. And if that doesn't tell you that stigma isn't still alive, then nothing else will, because it's really all in the money. That's the truest reflection of where Congress's uh, priorities are. And I agree with uh, much of what Tom said, but, um, but I have a different take on it with respect to the uh, worry about the implementation of evidence-based treatments. Um, I would rather that we had put that money that we are spending into really Medicaid uh, entitlement dollars rather than these block grants that have become the norm, really, uh, for, for your side of the aisle. And then what ends up happening is then they don't work or they get siphoned off or their balance billed, basically. They, they're used to pay for other things to uh, fill a budget gap within these states. And of course, there's a total patchwork quilt of, regu of regulations and standards. And it's no wonder people become frustrated by government programs. <clears throat> what we ought to do is treat it like we treat the rest of medicine. And that's reimburse it like we would cancer, diabetes, or cardiovascular disease. And we don't tackle those illnesses by appropriating block grants. We say that they're either insured or they're not. Now, we can also pass block grants to supplement what we already pay for through the insured market. But I think that uh, if, if Democrats have a chance uh, with the House back this time, I'm hopeful that we'll take some of those dollars, Tom, and, and try to figure out a way to fold them into expanded Medicaid uh, in the states. Let me, let me, if I may, uh, the, the um the comparison to HIV is important because it was a, a, a public health crisis. It was recognized as a crisis, um, and, and uh, folks from both side of the aisle, uh, sides of the aisle got together and said, uh, "Okay, something needs to be done." And what what actually solved uh, uh, much of it um, from a world standpoint, global standpoint, was the PEPFAR program. Now, PEPFAR uh, was the, was the presidential emergency uh, uh, program for uh, AIDS reduction, um, and. And the reason that it's important is that Washington, as I mentioned before, is all siloed. And so you've got all sorts of departments that have certain jurisdictions over certain areas, and, and, and they, they covet their resources um, to a fault. 
uh, and, and, and they rarely work together with the kind of seamless uh, um, activity that is so necessary for these kinds of crises. So um, I, I would uh, actually tag team with what Patrick said and say that we, what we need to do, I think, is look at another presidential emergency program. In fact, you could call it PEP4, Presidential Emergency Program for Opioid Abuse Reduction. Um, and, and what that allowed the government and would allow the government to do is to have an interdepartmental uh, organization that then has control over those resources, that then can move them to where they need to be. Um, and and uh, I, I think it's, it's really a lacking right now of Washington not, not providing a structure for the use of these resources. Because we could wake up in 10 years having spent 100 or $150 billion or, or, or more and still not be having put a significant dent into the 72,000 lives that are being lost annually. And how do we address the point that Patrick raised, which is for whatever problems there are handling this at the federal agency level, there are a whole lot more communities out there that are not where Morrison County, Minnesota okay. is. Uh, and uh, under capacity, under under resourced, now better resourced as a result of this money, but really potentially not using this money very well at all. How do we deal with that under a structure like what you described, Tom? You clone right. Dr. Bell and Dr. Devine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sh short of uh, so breakthroughs I in think, genetics. I think, the, genomics, I think Tom was right in the recognition that community really matters. I belong to a 12-step recovery community. That's what's been most influential in my ability to stay sober over seven and a half years, the longest period of sobriety I've ever had. And I believe that there is an argument for Tom's point that local communities know their own community better, that there isn't a one-size-fits-all. But I think we can adopt certain criteria for what best practices are in a given community that can help address the, as you heard previously, um, the social determinants of health, which, as was said earlier, account for essentially the greatest percentage of health status is really a result of, of social determinants. And in medical care, we really haven't gotten that kind of um, FEMA, to your point, like approach where we bring in the housing department. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we got, could get Ben Carson to get supportive housing for people in recovery from addiction and really understand how vital HUD is to the recovery program, and I might add probably to the rest of mental health and, and also the rest of medicine, and then also look at the other major factors in people's lives, transportation, child care, um, access to uh, employment. Those aren't just um, soft science anymore. We really know how to really facilitate them. Um, you know, 50 years ago during Johnson's uh, War on Poverty, you had the um, you know, Opportunities um, Employment Commission, and you had other uh, Equal Opportunities Office, and essentially what you were able to do is get Head Start, elementary and secondary education, legal aid, um, you know, a whole host of other very critical programs. And I think maybe back then they were very siloed in terms of the way they were appropriated and funded, but I think they're in this audience, everyone would agree that there are those pieces that are still needing attention. And the question is, how can we get a kind of a accountable care organization model and include, you know, social determinants of health into that by bringing in some of these other government agencies that have been left out of what's been defined as health care? Mm -hmm. Let's go take that point that you brought up about Medicaid, uh, and let's put that in the context of, again, of the election. We know that the Medicaid expansion now is in place in 32 states. There are now six states, as a consequence of the election, that are teed up now to undertake Medicaid expansion, so that could take it up to 38 states. We know there are still going to be states that will not move forward. And it, as we know, in the states that did expand Medicaid, Ohio, Michigan, I, I think John Kasich, the former governor of Ohio, said of the roughly 700,000 people enrolled in the expanded Medicaid program, 250,000 of them got opioid 
uh, substance use treatment as a consequence of it. So almost a third of the enrollees. Let's talk about Medicaid expansion in that context first. Is that going to be a vehicle for addressing the opioid crisis? And will that be another avenue to continue to get bipartisan support for Medicaid expansion? Tom? Well, I, I, I think it can be, but I think that the opioid crisis is, is uh, um, I, 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 bigger than the, the, the challenge of Medicaid expansion. Um, the, the, um, that's not to minimize the imperative of getting folks covered with some type of health coverage. And the question isn't whether they get covered, the question is what they get covered with. And that's, and that's where the rub is on, uh, on, on uh, the different sides of the aisle. Um, so I think, I, I think it can, but I think that if we would just do that, if we just get folks coverage in, in, in Medicaid, then we lose the opportunity or lose the ability truly to focus on the real solutions that I think are necessary for, uh, for the opioid crisis. And Medicaid expansion is, is uh, uh, I think, going to continue. I think it will increase the number of states. Um, three, I think three states just voted through, through a referendum, uh, uh, Idaho and Nebraska and Utah, uh, to, to expand their Medicaid programs. I, I, don't, I don't know what, you, if you look at those states, those aren't necessarily the most Democrat uh, uh, states that, that, that exist uh, in, in, the, in the country. So I think that there is a, a, a continuing desire to get folks covered, and, and if that's the avenue that people see to get folks covered, uh, then, then they'll grasp onto it. Um, I think there are better ways to do that, and we can talk about that if, uh, if you like. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the numbers in Ohio are stark and, and, and really um, uh, ought to get folks' attention. Uh, with uh, the with number of individuals that moved into the Medicaid expansion population, and then the number of those individuals, the third that you mentioned that, that were eligible or, or, or became uh, uh, recipients of substance use disorder treatment. And how do you, do you want to expand on that, Patrick, and your, your perspective on that? <clears throat> so this isn't just an opioid crisis. This is an addiction crisis. That's what none of my friends who aren't in recovery understand, that when you have the disease of addiction, you'll substitute one drug for another drug for another drug for another drug. And what you basically have is the disease of addiction. It's not, you know, an opioid addiction per se, because believe me, you can recover from that and you'll be right on to alcohol addiction if you don't under address the underlying uh, disease of addiction or any other. And I think that we still really have an illiteracy rate in this country with respect to understanding uh, the phenomena of poly drug addiction, which is what this really represents. Um, and as we know now, it's really more a fentanyl issue and a heroin issue than it is even a, a opioid. And it's legal moving to, to meth, back to meth, and, uh, and alcohol deaths still take the cake in terms of all of it combined. More people die of alcoholism than die of any of these other drugs. So, and that no one ever talks about taking on the epidemic of uh, alcoholism related deaths in this country. And then by the way, the suicide crisis, which never gets mentioned, is right behind this. And all of these things are connected in my view um, and require, as I said, us to take stock of a much bigger picture approach. Because to Tom's point, if we just address this on the surface, and don't understand how to address this in the long term, we're going to have a ripple effect for all these families that have addiction in their lives now because this epidemic is so pervasive. Think of all their kids. Think of the ripple effect. This thing is a family disease. It is a generational impact. Uh, not taking aside the fact that the number of kids in foster care has quadrupled in this crisis, and you're wondering how those kids are all gonna end up. So it's important for our country to think of this in a very comprehensive way, and not just think, you know, and I'm all for MAT, and frankly, we don't even have MAT adopted like we know we should have it adopted. 
universally in this country, and we still have physicians refusing to get wavered, even though the epidemic is in their backyard. We still have hospital systems not taking on the responsibility that they should have as a medical trustee to their community to do something about this epidemic and get their doctors certified and give them the time to get that extra training and not dock them the pay to get that extra training and encourage them to partner up with uh, outpatient clinics in, in concert with your hospital systems and your clinics. And frankly, the medical establishment has been, like the Congress, asleep at the switch. The AMA has, I think, failed miserably on this crisis. They ought to be out there encouraging all their members that this is a moral imperative on anyone with a medical license in this country needs to be part of this. This is the public health epidemic of our time, and I think the whole medical establishment has been largely missing in action. And that goes for on the suicide crisis, too. There are tons of things that we know we could do with your patients coming into your centers, just asking whether people have a feeling of wanting to harm themselves, asking whether they have the means to do so. Those questions, at a minimum, can help make enormous difference in the number of people who can get put into treatment. And, and those questions are rarely, if ever, asked. So this... this I oh, will certainly want you to respond to that, Tom. I, I want to say, though, this starts to edge us into another really interesting area where you think there would be a lot of bipartisan attention being paid, but there isn't really. And that's the fact that we do have a major health crisis in this country. And uh, Angus Deaton and Ann Case have labeled it the deaths of despair. Yes. These deaths now totaling 500,000 plus a year of largely white, less educated, lower income people. If you look at where this is distributed geographically, it's heavily throughout the South, South and Southeast. Uh, and these are people dying of, among other things, sort of a toxic stew of diabetes, uh, reporting very poor mental health uh, status, and lots of opioid use and substance use disorder, as well at, and often committing suicide and dying well before the end of their natural lifespan as a consequence of it. Now, you would think that there would be, the country would be up in arms about this. And as we know, in the longer haul, it looks like our life expectancy rate over the next uh, 10 or 15 years is going to drop to the level of Czechoslovakia and, or excuse me, Slo the Czech Republic, I should say. It's no longer Czechoslovakia. The Czech Republic and Mexico. <laughs> uh, you would think that would have people on both sides of the aisle really galvanized to do something about it, not necessarily just tackling the opioid crisis, but tackling this more broadly. So Tom, why hasn't this captured the imagination of people in the Congress, as well, well as in the executive branch? Let me, let me first, before I go to that, let, let me pile on with, with, with what Patrick said. And I know there's a love fest so far, and I'm sure we'll get to something upon which we disagree. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the other area that I think is an absolute tragedy and an embarrassment for our nation is how we treat those with severe mental illness. Um, and we, we have, over the last 40 or 50 years, taken a, an, an, an experiment of substandard treatment of folks in inpatient facilities, uh, decided that they all could be mainstreamed and moved them to the mainstream, and where we moved them was into the criminal justice system. So, and they continue to not get the kind of treatment, by and large, that they need. And I know there are a lot of folks out there that are uh, working your tail off to provide that kind of care, but as a group, they, they still are not getting uh, the, the, the kind of treatment that's necessary. I think it's a tragedy and a public and, and, a, and, a, and a national embarrassment, um, and, and uh, would, it doesn't, that doesn't get the kind of attention either. Um, you, you, you touched on one of my pet peeves about, about life expectancy because you, you hear the life expectancy in the United States is. Is, uh, uh, is, is decreasing, actually has decreased the last two years for, for, for uh, uh, males uh, in this country. Um, and, and so therefore the, the, the medical system has to be, you know, a disaster, right? And, and um, Patrick kind of hinted at it at the, with, with uh, uh, folks being asleep at the switch. 
Um, these folks aren't asleep at the switch, and I would suggest to you that if you drill down on the numbers and you actually look at it, if now you can't remove these 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 um, uh, these uh, uh, subgroups, but if you remove uh, from our life expectancy um, uh, uh, motor vehicle accidents, gunshot wounds, and and overdose deaths, then our life expectancy in in, in the nation is by and large as good or better than than the the vast majority of developed nations. Now, again, you can't remove those right, folks. Right, because we it, do have them. Because <laughs> right. you got them. But it does, set, it does tell you that, we ought, that that's where the focus ought to be. Um, and, 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 and we don't put, I don't think, the kind of focus on, on, uh, on those areas. Now, to your point about why doesn't Congress sit up and take notice of, of, the, um, uh, of the, 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 the tragedy of uh, uh, the, the, the increasing uh, death rate uh, for folks with chronic disease in, in a certain sector of, of our population and geography. And, and uh, it's, it, 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 Patrick will likely attest to this, and that is that those folks in Congress, 435 in the House and 100 in the Senate, they're wonderful people, but by and large, their, their level of appreciation and understanding of the healthcare system um, uh, either by experience or by, by, by knowledge, isn't terribly deep. Um, and that's not to say that they aren't good folks, it's just that that's not where their, their, their heart and their passion is. And so there are only so many things that Congress can do, and that tends to fall to the side because it's much more difficult to address those issues. These are not easy issues to address. Um, and, and as I alluded to earlier, I, I'm not so certain that Congress is actually the place to address them. Um, from a public policy standpoint, I think that that uh, if we if we listen to science and we listen to the folks that are actually charged with taking care of these people, we'll be a lot better off. Well, that assertion that the level of understanding in Congress about health care is not that deep is a good segue to talk about an area that still is quite a, very much in contention, which is the future of the Affordable Care Act. Now, we know that leading up to this, uh, Senator Mitch McConnell said we're still gonna go forward with repeal and replace leading up to the election. Now in the aftermath of the election, he has backtracked and said, no, we're not gonna push forward with any formal effort to repeal and replace. However, we also have the administration continuing to do a lot of things that, w that many argue are undermining the structure of the Affordable Care Act, allowing, for example, short-term health insurance plans onto the market. We also have the Texas uh, versus Azar lawsuit now, which, if it proceeds, would invalidate the ACA on the grounds of unconstitutionality as a consequence of the tax law last year that reduced the individual mandate penalty to zero. And the argument now that that causes the structure of the law to fall apart, therefore it is unconstitutional, therefore uh, it, uh, it is invalidated. We don't know how that lawsuit is going to proceed. One pres presumes it will proceed and eventually go to the Supreme Court. It's possible that there could be an injunction against the ACA as early as January or February if the judge rules in that way. And then we'll have a very interesting uh, crisis on our hands, really, in the Congress as people figure out how to grapple with that. So with that as sort of the preface, what happens next? Patrick. Uh, well, thank God the House came back Democratic. That's for, for my sake, because at least we have a chance to try to be part of the discussion here with guaranteeing that Americans are no longer left outside the health care system and only able to access it in an extreme emergency at very high cost to themselves and to the system. I think the whole purpose of the vision of everybody being in the tent is that we could better manage people's health care and ultimately start paying for the kinds of social determinant, prevention, early screening. In mental health, we don't do it till it's stage four of the illness. You know, we could save so much money on this, these addiction crises, these uh, mental illness crises if we just did a better job at um, doing the same type of very aggressive early screening that we do for cancer and diabetes and other chronic illnesses. The cost and severity and disability of these illnesses would go down dramatically if we did much more in the way of prevention. And everything that I hear these days 
uh, from people like all of you is that the direction we need to go in is this population health. That we really need to find the financial mechanisms that are going to incent us to do the things that we already know work, but we don't do now because of the current system is kind of set up such that it doesn't pay for the ROI in two, three, four years for us to do the prevention that we know can, we can go to the bank with. So that should be the challenge of both parties, is to come up with those innovations, because the total cost of, of our system is such an enormous cost, and we can do so much more with our 18% of uh, GDP than what we're getting from it now in our healthcare spend. So I think this is a bigger issue because if you've got three Republican states just passing expansion of Medicaid, it, it's inconceivable to me at this point that we're going to kind of go backwards where we're going to start to strip away people's benefits. What we ought to be doing is really putting on the discussion what type of models of accountability, you know, are you willing to buy off on and really uh, fund those? And I think that that would be um, the best way forward. Otherwise, we're just going to get really in, a, again, a, a tit for tat over kind of ideological differences. Um, but no one can ignore the American people want health care. They need health care. How do we actually get them real health? Um, without spending so much cost on medical care. Um, that should be the real challenge uh, for us. So that, uh, I don't know what, uh, if the, they rule the ACA unconstitutional, depends on how much of it they rule unconstitutional. If they throw the whole thing out, they're going to have to give a period of transition. Congress is going to have to respond. E everyone on a bipartisan level understands that we have to stabilize markets. I think there's some broad agreement on that. So. There may end up being more. Um, uh, the, 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 the real philosophical things that have been uh, termites to this are these uh, short duration, uh, limited plans, as you mentioned, Susan. Those are plans like the association health plans that really don't have as much adherence to the uh, issue of the pre existing condition and other essential health benefits. Um, so, the, you know, you can save money by just cutting back on care, or you can save money by paying for different things for care. And that should be the, the way to put the Democrats at the test. How do you want to spend your money saving? You know, if you really want to save money and protect long-term financial sustainability of this country, which is unsustainable with the current entitlements the way they, the way they are, um, then here's how we're going to go about doing it. And we're going to do it by challenging people to come up with how to keep you healthier. Yes, we thought we were talking about it with the HMO days. Yes, we thought we were talking about it with these alternative payment models and ACOs, but we really have only scratched the surface. Here are the new ways we're going to get at doing this. Here are the ways we're going to start doing um, social determinants. That, to me, should be the argument, as opposed to what it's going to be, which we both know is kind of inevitable direction, and that is, oh, you're stealing my health care, and everybody kind of going back and forth, and then no realistic solutions coming forward that are actually going to meet the needs and reduce long-term costs. Because as Democrats, we're going to lose if we don't come up with a more affordable way to deliver health care to all. We're not going to be able to de deliver it to all. So it's, it should be our imperative to, to come up with the, these innovations. And I think Republicans could really, you know, challenge us on this stuff. And um, I think the business community, uh, there, there are a number of examples. You know, at uh, RWJ, uh, you've, you've piloted a lot of these programs around the country. So... Um, so, Tom, I don't know if I answered anything well, that let's, you asked. Well, let's stay on this theme about what happens to the ACA for a moment. So, Tom, as you know, the House Democrats rode the issue of pre-existing condition protections very hard in the election campaign. The exit polls suggest that health care really was the number one issue for most of the Democratic voters who turned out and voted, and the pre-existing condition argument really, really resonated. In the face of that, what does the Republican Party do 
particularly if the ACA is ruled, uh, is invalidated? Well, I, I think that it's important. I mean, pre-existing conditions is, is, is an absolute vital issue that, that, that needs to be addressed. The good news is, is that Republicans believe the pre-existing conditions ought to be covered as well, and that, that the way that you have an opportunity to save money also is to provide increasing choices for, for patients and increasing transparency of what, what things cost and greater accountability so that you actually have a system that, uh, that, that works. Uh, fundamentally, the question is who decides? Who decides what your health care ought to be? Should you decide, or should the federal government? Uh, if passed as prologue, um, the, the, the folks who, who have just taken the majority status in, in, the, in the House of Representatives believe it ought to be the government. Um, Republicans, by and large, in the House believe that it ought to be the individual, that the individual ought to have the opportunity to select the kind of coverage that they want for themselves and for their family, because then it is more, must be, of, of necessity, uh, more responsive. But, but what about the, 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 the issue, though, is splitting up the risk pools, right? And you've, sure. you've got to, have, in order for, if you're going to cover pre-existing conditions, you need everybody in the risk pool. You need the sick as well as the healthy. And this issue of pretending that there can be both, that you can split up all the risk pools and just let the healthy peel off into separate insurance policies just for them means that we're going to drive all the other plans out of existence because they'll be covering the sick people. So that's the, you know, back to your earlier yeah. point that many in Congress do not understand health care. That does seem to be a big missing piece of, the, of that argument. That, that, that's true yeah. if you look at a static system. If, however, you, you, you put your thinking cap on and get creative and talk about real solutions and positive solutions, then you can actually provide coverage for all those individuals with pre-existing conditions, and you can do it more cheaply than we currently do it. I would use Maine as an example. Um, the uh, uh, the, the um, uh, invisible high-risk pools for that, that, that Maine has has, uh, has uh, proved remarkably, remarkably helpful in driving down costs, providing higher quality care for those individuals that, have, that, that, that are challenged from a disease standpoint, and decreasing the cost for everybody else in the pool because you've segmented that population and subsidized that population in a way that, 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 that allows them to get the kind of coverage uh, that they need. So we need, to be, we need to be more creative. We need to think more about what the real solutions are. And, and I would suggest that it's important that we as a society, we seem to have lost the ability to have sober conversation and discussion about real challenges. This is a real challenge. But I would suggest that it's important to step back and say, OK, what are our principles when we get to health care? What, what kind of principles do we have as a nation? We all believe that everybody ought to get covered. We all believe that that coverage ought to be affordable. We all believe that that coverage ought to be of the high, that health care ought to be of the highest quality. And by and large, we believe that patients ought to have choices. So if you, if you use those as your principles, that'll guide you in the direction that you need to go, as opposed to saying, okay, here we are. We've got this siloed system of Medicare, Medicaid, the ERISA plans, the exchange market, the individual small group market, VA, Indian Health Service, on and on and on. And we somehow expect that that siloed system has to be, and as it continues to be, that, that we just tinker at the sides of solutions in each of those silos. That ain't going to work. So do both of you see the prospect? Because what you're talking about is creating a reinsurance mechanism. Yeah, exactly. And the choices are not many. You either tell all the states to do that individually, as not only Maine has done, but Maryland and others, or you do that at the federal level. Well, we had federal reinsurance in the early years of the ACA, and Republicans didn't want it anymore, right? So how does this work out? How do you see this? Do you see, both of you, bridging that gap? Because you could do it, as you say, through reinsurance, but you've got to create the reinsurance mechanism. So how does that happen? Well, I mean, I think people are looking at this Medicare Advantage and thinking how it provides a real opportunity to uh, bring some alternative payment and innovation to the delivery of health care at a you know, competitive rate. And I think that uh, if you had a, essentially a Medicare for all, okay, everybody, uh, but you had it contracted out the way Medicare currently is, you could still have competition, but you could have uh, some of those uh, benefits of having a, a single payer system from the vantage point of not having, um, you know, this thing get so 
divvied up and then worrying about how to play the shell game as to who's in what pool. Um, so there may be, but, but this is really for folks who know about how to do this, but I think people can acknowledge that there would, that would be definitely a, something that would be worth discussing in terms of how to bring costs down in terms of economies of scale, having like a CMS for the whole, you know, shooting match and just doing it like we do Medicare Advantage. How, how would you see this playing out, Tom? Would you see, on, on, at least as a preferred solution of, among uh, Republicans, letting every state tackle the reinsurance sure. issue itself? Sure. Or, yeah, and, and you've got, I mean, you got to think about those principles. Uh, and then you've got to recognize that where we are right now has these, this, these siloed systems and continues to have 28 million folks uninsured. That's, not, that's a system that may be working for the federal government, but that's not working for patients. Um, and so you've got to devise a system that actually works for patients. And by that, I mean every single patient has to be able to have the opportunity to gain the kind of coverage that they, that they want. And there are ways to do that that don't require putting Washington in charge. And that's, that, that's where the rub comes. Because once Washington is in charge, then Washington defines what health care is. The, the, uh, this, the, uh, we haven't even talked about value yet. Value is one of those wonderful things that everybody wants. We all want value. But the equation for value is value equals quality over cost, which means that the definition of quality gets real important. And I can't remember who it was earlier, but discussed the uniqueness of patients and, and, and what's quality treatment for one individual with one diagnosis because of their age, comorbidities, desires, needs, support system, uh, on and on and on and on, may be significantly different than what's quality treatment for another individual with the exact same diagnosis. So it's not a widget. It's a unique individual that requires a unique treatment plan and requires care uh, that, that, that may be markedly different than somebody else with the exact same diagnosis. Now, you, you ask Washington to try to get their arms around that concept. Um, that, that's that's an, almost a, a, a null set for them to be able to do that. Um, so I, I, I think we've just, we've got to be We've got to be more creative. We've got to be more goal focused. We've got to be more willing to, to have this conversation and, and banter it back and forth and have, have uh, I hope, committed to uh, all individuals being at the table. And, and, uh, and, and uh, I'm, an, I'm an eternal optimist, so not the political sniping that tends to uh, occur um, uh, more and more. So a year ago, there was a bipartisan effort in the Senate, Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray, to, to put together a stabilization package for the ACA that would have, among other things, restored the cost-sharing subsidies because a big piece of getting people covered mm -hmm. is subsidizing their coverage, among other measures. And there was also a reinsurance component. Do you see that kind of an effort being resurrected in this new Congress? Patrick, Tom? Hopefully. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the reason I say that is that the Senate, um, the Senate's a, a remarkable body, um, and they're, they're curious in, in their activity and, um, and how they make, uh, they make decisions, but they tend, to, uh, uh, they, they tend to move in the direction. I believe they'll move in the direction more of a Democratic House than would a Democratic, Democrat Senate to a Republican House. So, uh, and, and the president, uh, this president is, is desirous of making deals, um, as you all know. Um, and so I think there will be deals that will be made. And uh, the, the, the concern that those of us who are, uh, have, have about fiscal matters for our nation um, uh, is real because the Senate uh, um, will, will uh, um, almost always spend more money um, and come to an agreement on how to spend more money. So in a few minutes, we're going to open this up to questions and comments uh, from all of you, and perhaps even uh, short speeches masquerading as questions, if you feel so <laughs> moved in that direction. Uh, but before we get there, I want to come back to Patrick's uh, tantalizing suggestion. If I heard it right, it's not Medicare for all, it's Medicare Advantage for all. Uh, Essentially, and this is, there have been iterations of this idea before. People have talked about having Medicare Advantage plans be on an exchange. Uh, you could have people buy into those plans. 
uh, may be somewhat subsidized. There have been discussions about a Medicare buy-in for people 55 and older, where some subsidies would be made available to buy, in effect, a Medicare Advantage plan. Is that the pathway forward in, under Medicare for all, more so than this uh, sort of fantasy single-payer system? I, I don't mean to disparage it, but I think somebody on one of the earlier panels uh, said it was hard to imagine the entire private U.S. insurance industry going away overnight and right. being supplanted by a single-payer system. So I guess really the question is, would this be another avenue, and would that, is there any reason to believe that that might have bipartisan support? If the issue really is, as you said earlier, devising coverage that is affordable, that people agree is comprehensive, that gives people choice, Medicare Advantage as done, was created on that basis, is that a path forward or is that a complete non-starter? Patrick? Well, I, I couldn't have said it better than you did just there in terms of I think that it is very realistic, but it's like among many things that could be debated. I think it has its advantages in not being so radical that it's written off. And as I said, it allows us to move to what I think is inevitable, and that is that we have some type of single-payer system because of the um, you know co economies of scale. and. Um, and the risk and all of those issues. And then I think that you have to give the innovation and that part of it and the competition of our insurance industry could still be allowed to, to participate. Um, so so that, those are the rough confines. That's the reason I mentioned it. What do you think, Tom? Well, uh, I mean, Medicare for All is, is Washington's latest Rorschach test, right? It's uh, um, uh, people talk about Medicare for All and they mean um, countless different things. Um, because if, if you truly have Medicare for all, then you do away with ERISA plans. So you do away with the self-insured plans, which is where the majority of Americans get their health coverage. 165, 170 million folks get their coverage through ERISA plans. So are we, are we, are we uh, interested in doing away with that? I don't think so. Um, uh, and, and, uh, um, and why one would embrace a system that currently has one out of every eight physicians about in this nation who ought to be seeing Medicare patients not seeing Medicare patients, and it's not because they forgot how to care for Medicare patients, it's because the system doesn't work for them. In fact, um, in, in many instances, the, uh, the, the, um, the Medicare program doesn't cover the cost of providing the care for uh, certain, certain patients, and consequently, the, the folks providing that care say, you know, time's up, I can't, I, I can't do that. Um, and if I put my old budget chair, house budget chair hat on, then I, then I, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't say that within a 10 year period of time, according to the trustees and according to anybody who's looking at the numbers, uh, this system goes broke or whatever language you want to use, which doesn't mean it goes away. It just means that, oh, by the way, it can only provide 70 plus percent of the services that it is promised that we as a society have promised seniors. Um, uh, unless we raised taxes, unless we or, did right, well, right, or, and, uh, unless we did something, right. yeah, um, and 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 that's not a program I think that 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 deserves embracing. Uh, not that it does. It, it it the folks providing care out there aren't genuine in their sincere desire to provide care and working as hard as they can to provide that care. But that's not something that makes a whole lot of sense to me to to say, okay, yeah, this program's not working from a financial standpoint. You got. Uh, an eighth of the individuals who ought to be providing care not providing the care, and so let's expand it to the entire country. Um, I, I, I just think that there are many, many better ways to handle it uh, and to provide coverage and to do so in a way that recognizes those principles, affordability, accessibility, quality, and, and, and choices. And if we do that, then we'll be on the right track. But that, what that means is that that means patients are making those decisions and not Washington, D.C. My refute to that would be that we're just not investing in prevention whatsoever. And none of these insurers invest a nickel in prevention, no matter what the hell they say. And the fact of the matter is, if we're really going to reduce the cost curve, we've got to get in there early and do real population health. And there's going to be no financial incentive to do that unless the federal government's sitting on a big one to, to have to solve. And that the need for us to finally do real population health is going to be out there to do it. Aside from the fact that most people 
it's already impossible for them to access health coverage with all of their deductibles and co-pays and the like. And it is going to get worse and worse and worse. So yes, it is a, a challenge financially, but it depends, as you said, on th us thinking about the current system as it's defined currently as a medical system versus the, the next generation health system as we might have a better chance of defining it. But we could still leave it to folks to come up with innovations and bring some competition in on it, but that we would then have the risk to then, as, as Uncle Sam would have it, to make the investments that we know need to be made in population health. And until uh, we, we own it all, I don't think we're going to have that incentive. The, uh, I, I would, I, my refutation to that would be that, that you, can't, you can't criticize a system that doesn't exist as being a solution. So right now, it's not patients that are making these decisions. It is either the federal government through the Medicare program or it's the human resources officer or the, or the boss that are making the decisions. So the patients aren't engaged in, in this. They aren't able to say, I want preventive health, I want wellness programs, I want, I want uh, uh, X, Y, Z, and I control those resources which they don't now, by the way, I control those resources and demand that. And if they're able to do that and they actually have power in this equation, then in fact we get the system to move in the direction that it ought to move, that is the direction that patients want it to move, not the direction that the government wants it to move. I want to tee up the question, which we can talk about at greater length uh, later on, which is cost of, cost, uh, the cost of health care and the particular relationship now prescription drugs. Let me just mm -hmm. s stake out some ground that we'll come back to that, but we do want to get to questions from the audience first. So questions, comments, let's uh, start right here in the front and we'll come back to, uh, to prescription drugs and what might be done because I, both of you identified that work as an area where you thought there could be bipartisan uh, cooperation. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Price, I want to say uh, it's good to have you here in person because uh, the media can damage anything. <laughs> and so it's good to actually have you here. Thank You're you for showing me. up. Pardon me? You're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Right, in fact, I think that the people who actually uh, engage in that take a, take a lot of heat. So thank you for showing up. Um, I am fundamentally a finance guy who was trained in neuropharmacology. So let me just say that the government actually determines everything about healthcare now. And this point is often lost. So you determine the payment for a very many long, for a long period of time, the AMA influenced HHS, so whatever they said kind of went, and the government then institutionalized an apparatus that didn't have, what's the most efficient way to allocate our capital to pay for services? So in the real marketplace, uh, you would call that uh, having an unfunded put option on somebody else's capital. It's not really what there is that you can do because it's, it's already controlling it just inefficiently and ineffectively. Which, by the way, Medicare for all, and if you, you are absolutely right, I agree with you entirely as a finance guy, doesn't make a lot of sense to take something that barely works for 200, I'm filling your thing about speeches, right? 290 million, but I do have a question for you. If you could, if you could operate a marketplace in healthcare differently than the way it is operated now, and differently than just relying on subsidizing the toughest cases, who essentially are already the failures of the system anyway. You said be creative. What, what would be your second best shot at this? Okay, so how do you get to a, a competitive market in healthcare is the essence of the question? I could have said that a lot simpler, couldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom? I, I, think, I think that there, that one of the major keys and flaws in our current system is that patients are inconsequential in this system uh, in terms of making these decisions, and they've been forced into that, that bucket. Um, and so if one believes that, and one believes that markets actually distribute resources and, and allocate resources and, and efficiencies better than anything else, then you got to get the patient in that equation in a fundamental, powerful way. And the only way that I know to do that is to allow patients, all patients, to own their health coverage regardless of who's paying the cost. So that, that, that patients uh, can, could move that, that power, that money, themselves on an annual basis uh, and move it into the system that they desire for themselves and for their family. That way then you inject 
the, 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 the desires and the needs that patients have, because they know better than anybody else the needs that they have, um, into the system, and then the system moves in a direction that actually can solve the problem. Where does price transparency fit into that? Abs it, it's absolutely vital, and we, and we have virtually none of it now. If you, if you go in and, 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 and see your doc, as you all well know, um, and, and ask he, he, he or she how, how much that costs, they don't know. I didn't know when I was practicing orthopedics, by and large. I mean, I, because I didn't have to know. It wasn't, it wasn't part of what, what, uh, what, what I, I needed to do to be able to, to get my day accomplished um, and, and, and help patients. And so price transparency is absolutely vital and accountability is absolutely vital. You've got to have those things in order for a market to work. And we had some discussion earlier about uh, hospital charge masters, for yeah. example, and their role in that. Okay, let's move to another question or comment. I have a question about... Um it's basically a first a comment that there are so many other countries that seem to provide health care in a more effective, efficient way than we do in the United States. And I'm wondering why we don't really take a serious look at some of these other best practices and try to implement them here. Why are we trying to reinvent the wheel when there are many other countries that have great systems in place? And I'm not sure why we wouldn't want to copy another country that has success. Patrick, do you want to take that? Um, well, we're, we're America. We like to do it our way. Was it Churchill who said Americans always do the right thing after exhausting all the other alternatives? Mm -hmm. Maybe we're, we're, we haven't exhausted them all yet. We're close. Right? We're, mm -hmm. we're close. No, I mean, I, I think that we know how with the obviously big data and health economics, we know where the fact that medical care accounts for a fraction of what's really gonna keep people healthy. And the fact of the matter is, we should have a med strong medical system that is the envy of the world, but we ought to have a health system that's, no that's non-existent right now in terms of that would reduce the total cost of medical care by making sure we ha aren't buried in so many comorbidities that are sinking our budget and that are dramatically much more tractable than we think if we had the right financial incentive system to incentivize us to treat early and even prevent those that we know who are high risk for these chronic and very disabling and extremely costly health conditions. And that is, you know, you don't need to be a single payer or existing payer system to know that that can be done if it just takes political will to do it. Those nations uh, don't have 320 million people. Um, and if you look at, at many of the challenges that they have, their, their, their populations um, uh, culturally oftentimes accept things that Americans won't accept. Uh, so uh, queuing up for, um, for certain tests or examinations or surgical procedures or the like are things that I would suggest to you Americans by and large would, would not do. But the question is, so what, what, how, how do you get to that, that, that solution? Um, that there are a number of nations, I think, that, that do allocation of, uh, of those choices and those resources better than we do. We have, we have some of the highest quality care in the world. If you take the top five cancer diagnoses uh, in, in, in the Western world, the likelihood of, uh, if you were to, to be unfortunate to have, to, to have one of those diagnoses, the likelihood of you surviving that and having a, a longer life expectancy with that is, is greatest in, in four or five of those in the United States of America in certain areas. Now, our problem is, is that we don't allocate those resources in an equitable way across the entire system. So it doesn't mean that the quality of care is bad. It means that individuals don't have the accessibility that I talked about earlier to that quality of care often. And so how do you do that? I would suggest that Switzerland is a model that we ought to look at. Switzerland's a model that, that, uh, that, that subsidizes more than I think we ought to subsidize because I think individuals ought to have great choice opportunity to, to, to use their resources as they see fit. But 
Switzerland allows individuals, the government doesn't run anything, allows individuals through that subsidy the opportunity for folks to own that coverage and select the kind of coverage that they want. And you get that kind of uh, competition for that, that dollar or whatever, Swiss, Swiss francs, I guess. Swiss francs, right. <laughs> um, francs, to, to, because the patient's making that decision. That's a system that I think has some merit. The biggest thing that separates our system from other systems is the price level. Uh, that probably accounts for 50% of the cost differential, even between yep. us and Switzerland. And the other thing is the Swiss will negotiate prices. Yep. The cantons negotiate prices with hospitals, and the, the Swiss negotiate the drug prices they're going to pay. We seem to be reluctant to do that, to have the gov at a governmental level price negotiation. Do you think that's going to change? And one that gets me back to the prescription drug question, because now we have the Trump administration proposing, in effect, to tie our Part B drug prices to the prices paid internationally, which means we're going to piggyback on their price regulation system. So are we starting down a new path uh, that we haven't been on before, basically opening the door to regulating prices, uh, particularly with respect to prescription drugs? Yeah, I think, I think it's a, uh, an, un, uh, an unfortunate proposal and, a, and not a great path to be going down. Um, I, I, I would suggest that if we reference base our prices for pharmaceuticals off of, off of uh, Western Europe or off of the OECD countries, that we will see significant, the, one of the results of that will be significant uh, decrease in, in uh, R&D uh, and significant decrease in innovation. Um, and, and I think that's a, a, not a path down which we ought, ought to go. We also are reluctant, from a cost standpoint, to have an honest conversation about what the true cost drivers of healthcare are. Um, and, and let me suggest that there are three of them that don't get talked about as much as they should. One of them is regulation. We, we and uh, some of the folks earlier were talking about the, or maybe it was at lunch, we're talking about the regulatory uh, uh, scheme that's in place. Uh, the regulatory burden on those providing the care uh, uh, in our nation, I would suggest to you, is greater here than in any of those other uh, uh, OECD countries. Um, that cost is passed on through our system. Uh, the second area that, isn't, that by and large doesn't exist in other nations is the cost of litigation, and it's not the cost of malpractice insurance for physicians and for other providers, it's the cost of the practice of defensive medicine, which are the things that I did, it's things that every physician does to make certain if they're ever called into a court of law, they, don't, they, they can honestly look the judge and the jury in the eye and say, I don't know what you wanted me to do. I did everything. When in fact, everything is rarely necessary to either treat or to diagnose the patient. Now, you might think that that's minuscule, but the estimates are that it's between one out of every four and one out of every three dollars in this nation annually. That's, even if that's off by a factor of 50%, that's three to four hundred billion dollars a year, a year. And then the third issue is the whole cost of, of a lack of competition. We don't have any competition by and large in our healthcare system, and so we don't decrease through a market standpoint uh, the, 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 uh, the provision of the services from a cost standpoint. So if we would have an honest conversation about what the true cost drivers are in healthcare and address those true cost drivers, then we'd see our costs come in line with, uh, with, with the vast majority of the other uh, Western de developed countries. Great. Okay, let's move to another question. I guess over here, we'll go to this side of the room. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, I was just going to comment the same thing, and um, Dr. Price, you really hit it right on. Um, the litigation, where we actually have to do a lot of testing to protect ourselves, and the way the legal system is working right now, it really forces hospitals and physicians to do a lot of unnecessary testing. Patients come to the ER, and, and, and we spend billions of dollars in electronic health records, they're still not going to look into the records and they still want to do another CT, another blood work and all that because if they just missed on something, you know, that's going to be a big lawsuit. Um, the R&D is a big issue, you know, Western nations, Canada and Europe, they refuse to pay for the R&D. Our pharmaceutical companies are charging the cost for the R&D for 20 years to the American consumer. But Canadians and Europeans refuse to pay for it and buying those same medications at a fraction of what we're paying for it. So it's unfair to compare the cost of healthcare in the United States with the rest of the Western 
developed nations. And thirdly, with the legal um, issue, that's that's really a big big thing which we just talked about. And I know that uh, beside that is technology and a lot of those inventions and so and, and and decisions. You know, in many countries, decisions for DNR is not the decision of the patient or the family; it's the physician choice. And here, the families are asking us to do everything that is possible for those patients. And they're driving the cost up. And then they wonder why it costs that much when my loved one was in the hospital and I got a bill for a million dollars and they were in the hospital for 60 and 70 so, days and the end of time. So thank you. I, I think we have another short speech, sure. which, which was very good. But did, but did you have a question attached no, to that, that as well? No, that was just a comment to okay. actually compliment what Dr. Price said. OK. OK. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. All right. Let's move. I have move a question up. over here. To your right. OK. Over here. <laughs> thank you. Um, by the way, I was standing over there before, and Michelle took the microphone out of my hand. Um, I did not resist that or push her hand away. <laughs> but then again, my name's not Acosta, so. Um, I'm also very blessed to have health insurance. Um, I, my cost is about $20,000 a year for a, um, for a high deductible plan. So I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, my question to you guys is, what are the odds that anybody, that the government Congress, the House, or anybody is actually going to do something about that. So we talked a lot about costs, and you have made some brilliant points. We've heard a lot about costs throughout the day today. And again, my question is, what are the odds that something's going to actually happen? So back to the question of cost and addressing some of the drivers of costs that Tom enumerated. Do we think it's going to happen in any meaningful way? And I think we also have to put on the table costs. Uh, it's scope of practice issues, right? It's protection of various sectors. Uh, doc, docs want to stay docs, and they want to keep a lot of the nurses out of their business, et cetera, et cetera. So we have, we have a system that's kind of baking in the prices and baking in structures for people to continue to extract the prices that they want. Are we ever going to deal with that? Uh, Patrick, do you want to make a comment? <clears throat> I guess uh, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know whether Congress would deal with that. Uh, the market is supposed to deal with that, and political system being what it is, I, don't, I just don't know how that's going to work out. Uh, maybe Tom will have an idea on that, how to answer that question. Um, I think the, uh, there is a lot of defensive medicine. I think there's got to be something done on that. Um, you know, I, it was interesting because when, you know, the, we could have the Federal Torts Claim Act kind of indemnifies docs who, who practice in community health centers because they're federal employees. And uh, it was interesting because when Ronald Reagan came in, he wanted to cut the size of uh, government employees. So he, he basically furloughed them all and had them contract with the same community health centers and they all had to pay a huge exorbitant uh, malpractice insurance just to get the political win of them uh, no longer being officially government employees. So um, the bottom line is I think you could get a lot of democratic support for um, addressing you know, some um, t Federal Torts Claim Act proposals for those who are dealing in especially in the highest risk areas of obstetrics and everything else that end up being huge cost drivers to the system. Um, and I think there, there are other ways to deal with those uh, uh, catastrophic tragedies that may take place. Um, in terms of some of the other issues, I think that um, the prices on drugs, I too am a believer that we can't have the unintended consequence of trying to reduce drug prices end up eliminating the in innovation that we have in our country in terms of biomedical research. Uh, my late father, Senator Edward Kennedy, was uh, the champion of more NIH funding for years. And uh, we still had the best um, biomedical innovation economy in the world. But that's not necessarily going to always be the case if we don't uh, preserve it. And I think it's in our people's interest to have that innovation. So I hate to be subsidizing uh, those Europeans and Canadians who are riding off of us. 
Um, but I also would not want to give up what is really one of the greatest indigenous industries that we have that still produces a lot of great jobs and sparks the imagination of all of our people. And so um, I think that there is, a, if we have transparency in prices, I think we can say to these pharma companies, you know, how much did you put in versus how much did the feds put in? Like, did NIH really take this molecule all the way this far down to field goal range and now you're slapping a huge price on it when you really can't justify the R&D costs? The other thing I would say is we could probably reduce their costs of drugs dramatically by using what we know to be personalized medicine today. So why we don't do more kind of uh, segmenting of the market, which is taking genetic subtypes of various populations and targeting molecules for those subtypes, which is not what pharma is geared to do today, but which with a partnership between FDA and with pharma, we could do more of, which would dramatically reduce the total cost of taking a drug to market, which as you all know today is a billion and a half, two billion dollars. So um, it also may give us more targets, shots on goal to deal with therapeutics for our particular type of illnesses, understanding that each of our illnesses is not, not one monolithic illness, it's a spectrum of, of illnesses in many instances, and that's cancers to depressions to developmental disabilities to cancers. It really characterizes all of illnesses. And we really haven't you know, made that fundamental change within the way the FDA regulates pharma that could both unlock innovation and reduce, in my view, uh, the total cost of bringing a a one-size-fits-all drug to market. Well, so, so just quickly, back to the question of the affordability of health insurance. Uh, health insurers now say that prescription drug spending is about a third of their costs in many instances. So it's shot up quite dramatically. And to the point of whether we're subsidizing uh, or other, the innovation that other countries are not paying for, people will point out that there's a very fine line between the United States paying for more of the innovation and also subsidizing the greater profitability of the industry, because this is a very profitable industry. So if we're paying higher prices, we're also subsidizing that. And I guess the question is, are we as a country ready to look at that and say, we're not so much in favor of subsidizing the high profitability of this industry to the degree we have so far? Is that yeah. something we're willing to come to grips with? I, we need to, yeah. absolutely. Um, but but the, the, you can deal with this trade issue in a couple ways. You can say we're going to be like them, and 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 extract a lower cost, or you can say we're not going to allow them to do what they're doing. And and I would suggest that that's that's the better path to take from a trade standpoint. This is a trade issue as much as it is a health health issue or a medical uh, issue. And and um, I would encourage the administration to, to take that stance. Uh, um, which they've done in a number of different areas from a trade standpoint, and say, you can't do that to our companies. We're not going to let you do that. You, you, for, for developed nations, you're going to have to pay your fair share. Um, and, and I think, that, I think that's, that's something that, that ought to be embraced, could be embraced by the American people. I've lost who, get, who asked that question, but I think there are a number of things that can be done. One, a couple of them have been alluded to uh, here and get, get kind of uh, uh, scoffed at or poo-pooed by, the, by the, the friends on the other side. And, and, and those are the short duration plans, limited duration plans, and, and the association health plans. Association health plans is something that I've been fighting for for decades because you've got these folks in the individual and small group market, the small employers, the small businesses out there who don't have access to the kind of benefits of the ERISA plans, the large employer uh, plans, and simply to allow them to pool their resources together solely for the purpose of purchasing health coverage makes imminent sense and lowers the cost of, of, of coverage for, for folks. Um, so I, I'm not sure why it's opposed by folks on the other side, but it, but it is. That's a solution that I think that, that uh, with the, the, the Department of Labor uh, rule, which I think they 
didn't get exactly right, but, but association health plans are a, are a path to be able to lower costs for small businesses and, and, and their employees. Uh, another area that I think you'll see a lot of in, the, in, the next, uh, in this next Congress uh, is, uh, is waivers, both 1115 waivers uh, in, in the Medicaid space as well as 1332 waivers in the, in the um, exchange population space. And I think that um, for those of you out there that are interested in, in, in being creative, I think CMMI is a jewel that hasn't been utilized to the degree that it could be. If you've got a better plan, I think this administration is wide open to listening to what you think might be uh, helpful in terms of coverage, in terms of care, in terms of uh, uh, following uh, uh, patient outcomes and quality. So uh, um, I would encourage you to get uh, to, to, uh, to, to push the administration to move in a better direction in your sphere. Great. Okay. Uh, let's take a couple of the remaining questions that we have, and then we will move shortly to wrap up. Hi. Thanks, Susan. Um, I have a, have a two-part question, I, although coming off the heels of what Dr. Price just mentioned about, you know, innovative uh, plans, innovative insurance plans to suit the individual's needs. I'm a person who's fairly healthy and um, spending, um, you know, let's say $800 a month for my health care plan, of which I never use because I'm lucky, I'm healthy. So it'd be kind of cool if I could just pay for what I need as opposed to have to pay $800 a month for my one-time preventative um, visit. So I love the idea of being able to think more creatively about how we can meet each other's needs. And then the other thing, I guess, a question for all of you is, coming back around to the root of the issue, we have a, a large percentage of people, a small percentage of people, excuse me, who cost us a large percentage of money. And a lot of those are with various illnesses. And if we go back around to prevention, do you think there's a chance that we'll get to a, a time where we can incent um, um, practitioners uh, for, prevent, for prevention services, in other words, give doctors incentives to keep patients healthy and help them up down a path of understanding nutrition and the correlation of things they can do to help ward off disease, whether that's cancer or diabetes or, or heart disease. There's things that can be done to keep people healthy, and I feel like we don't do enough of that. So do you think there's a chance we could ever get to a place where we can make that a part of the healthcare conversation and equation so that, so that we're paying less money for treating the disease. Um, and, and that includes expensive drugs to treat, to and treat the, those diseases. This gets back to your perspective, Patrick. So, so why don't you start? <clears throat> when I was a state legislator, um, we put together a prevention fund in Rhode Island where we assessed every one of the insurers based upon their market share of covered lives in the state a basically per capita assessment, all of which went to a pool that was dedicated to a prevention fund that they were helpful in determining what got covered. Because the idea was that none of them were at a competitive disadvantage because they all paid a, a commensurate rate based upon their market share, and all of them would reap the benefit of healthier subscribers as those young people and children became adults and all became part of their membership. And I just think that just is so damn simple, Tom. I don't know why, and, and frankly, we should expand it. You know, it's well baby care and all the usual inoculations and the like, but God, if we could, uh, you know, expand it to really good evidence-based uh, other interventions, it would be, it would make a lot of sense. Um, and it would make a lot of sense for the federal government and, and even like CMMI to look at ways to incentivize those prevention funds and then, you know, build them out and, and then have all the payers pay into it based upon their market share. So there's no, it's a pro rata basis. Anyway, that's the kind of thing that politically got me interested in, in being in government, so to solve problems. Um, the idea of the uh, association health plans and individuals is, goes to back to Tom's point about principles. The principle is we all pay in for fire, for police, for all the other things that we expect as citizens. And the idea is it, when it comes to health care, uh, there, but for the grace of God goes each and every one of us, or that we, you know, have a, an accident, go over the sidewalk, get hit, 
something happens to us, and then we're the ones who have a catastrophic illness and then can no longer get affordable health care. So the real principle, the moral principle is, are you willing to pay more so that, you know, that person can have the care, even if that person's not you today? That, that's the kind of more fundamental, I think, debate uh, in terms of what is going to the whole risk pool, how, how do we, are, are we subscribing to this notion that we all ought to be in community rating, understanding that as a community, who amongst us would trade places with the person with that physical pre-existing condition? We walk out of the rooms, they stay here, they're stuck. You know, that's the kind of idea that we have to have a, a debate about as a country, what kind of country we want to be. But that there are plenty of other ways that we can reduce medical costs, many of which have just been discussed by Tom and I here. All right, well, let's take a breather here for just a moment and look back at where we've come over the course of this hour and a half of conversation. We started with the premise that it was a historic election. And Tom, as you said, now the operative premise is things need to get done. Things need to get done. Now, you all agreed for some things that there is enough commonality between the parties that maybe some things could get done. And first on the list, you said, was coming back at the opioid crisis and the addiction crisis, to really call it what it truly is, That's Patrick, right. as you said. And that there would be potentially some support for additional resources. You had some difference of opinion about where those resources should go, but clear feeling that the federal response to date has been pathetic and it has to be bigger, and Tom, you introduced the notion of a PEPFOR approach to it, uh, modeling off the PEPFAR program for HIV AIDS internationally, bring a domestic version of that to bear on tackling the opioid crisis. So that was one thing where you thought there could be some, uh, some consensus. Uh, you all, we also talked about uh, the uh, Medicaid expansion and how that could be, will be an additional vehicle to deal with opioids as well as dealing with this issue, the remaining issue of those who are uncovered. And as we know, a number of people remain uncovered in states that have not to this point expanded Medicaid and now that will be dealt with at least in certain states. Uh, Tom, you brought up the notion that the level of understanding in Congress about healthcare is not huge. Uh, and that that obviously gets in the way of addressing some of the real fundamental problems that we face in terms of the health of the population. And Patrick, you've called for obviously a much greater population health focus to spend more money on prevention, spend more money on front, up front, attack the social determinants of health and these larger drivers of cost. Uh, you had some difference of opinion about Medicare for all or Medicare Advantage for all or whatever we end up calling it. Tom, you call that Washington's new Rorschach test, figure out what this means, Medicare for all. I guess we might go down the road to learning more about that over the next uh, few months. And then uh, we've now just uh, landed on the issue of costs. And you have some different ideas about how to deal with the prescription drug issue but also uh, so clear sense that we do have to go back and attack some of the major cost drivers, whether it's litigation, whether it's regulation, lack of competition. We have this discussion about the role of price transparency, et cetera. So that's a pretty robust list of things that need to be done. Let's close by me asking you, let's say we're back here a year from now. Tell me what on that list got done in the next year. Tom? Um, I, I, I think that there will be uh, an addressing of the opioid crisis. I don't know whether it will be a cogent addressing of the opioid crisis, but I think that there will be another, uh, another swing uh, taken at that. Um, I do think there will be a push to try to stabilize the markets in some way, the, the health care market, the health insurance market. Um, and and uh, I'm not sure how that, what that will look like, but I think there, there, there will be a push. People are are uh, frustrated by the amount that they're spending. The deductibles are significantly higher than they can afford, and so I think there'll, there'll be a push there. I think there'll be some, some uh, uh, technical nibbling at the sides. I, uh, as I mentioned in, 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 I think, my opening, the, the meaningful use issue, the electronic medical records, interoperability, I don't hold out great hope that what they come up with will be a solution, but I think that they'll, they'll continue to, to whack at that. 
um, what I leave out. Well, and so just quickly, stabilization means the president agrees to make that deal. But, and you think that will happen? And uh, the, the, the deal to be made is greater state flexibility for greater stabilization in the market. Okay. What gets done in the next year, Patrick, of that list? I think Tom's got it. Uh, I think that uh, among the opioid things, going back to uh, 42 CFR, we need to have interoperability of medical records. And it's outrageous that, frankly, uh, Democrats have been the biggest um, opponent of that, I think wrongfully so. Uh, uh, for those of you out there who are not getting reimbursed for care that you're giving for your patients who have a mental health diagnosis, uh, you can go on the Kennedy Forum. Dot org. We have ParityTrack.org, uh, and we have uh, ParityRegistry.org. At Parity Registry, you can have your um, patients learn how to file an appeal in a very expeditious way. Um, and, and I might add that there's a way for you to see where your state falls on the parity uh, metrics. And there's an, also a Millman report that's on the website that will show you the levels of disparity in access to care um, in every one of the 50 states. And there's not one insurance company that's close to being of compliant with the federal law that says that they're to no more restrictively uh, provide access to care for mental health and addiction than they would medical or surgical care. Uh, and it's an outstanding issue. And I hope the Congress adds to the list that Tom just mentioned um, stiffening the penalties of insurance companies so that we no longer just go after uh, pharmaceutical companies if that's the popular thing to do, but that we also hold the insurance industry accountable in much the same way that we're holding some of the pharmaceutical companies accountable for this great crisis because a lot of the insurers knowingly look the other way uh, and let people um, you know, get neglected care and in some cases die and they knew better and, and it's 10 years since the law passed and they're still not making a concerted effort to comply with the law. So if you're interested, um, the KennedyForum.org uh, is, is a resource for you or for any of your uh, members who are interested in, in parity. And another piece of unfinished business, uh, getting, getting to actual parity. So I joked earlier that these two suffered from the pre-existing condition of having been members of Congress. <laughs> but I think you can see that they were stunning exceptions to the general rule that Tom articulated, that so few members of Congress generally understand health care. These two did, and they continue to do so. And you saw some demonstration of that very powerful force uh, that is alive and well today of people who understand the issues, continue to speak out on them, and continue to help to improve the health care that we have in place for all Americans. So join me in thanking them for a terrific discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.